And good morning. Good morning. Yeah, welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. And as we begin our service, a few announcements to highlight. Um, some anniversaries today, Joshua and Jessica Gieschen are celebrating their second anniversary. Tomorrow, Scott and Kim Ballou, their seventh anniversary. And on Friday, Wilmer and Faye Schultz, their 11th anniversary. So happy anniversary. <laughs> and we have some birthdays today, Lori Gast. And also this week, Alyssa Schmall, Karen Neal, Rhonda Vanden Bogard, and Caitlin Furman. So happy birthday. Um, some, some good news. Um, Joanna Fisher Strzeski is doing well. She was in the hospital with type 1 diabetes. She's back home. She's on the upswing. And so we need to continue to remember Joanna in our prayers. Um, also, Friday, May 30th, here at the church, starting at 6.30 p.m. sharp, we're going to have a movie in here, Saving Mr. Banks, and then there will be free popcorn and soda provided, and I don't know if we officially have a social committee anymore, but if, the, if people wanted to get behind that and, and do something else with that, that would be awesome. But we'll have a movie night here, for, and it's open to everyone who wants to attend, and the movie will last about two hours. And then there'll be a brief discussion of the movie from a Christian perspective. We'll have you out of here by 9 p.m. Friday, May 30th. Um, also, June, at the June 1st worship service, um, Danielle Vanden Bogard is going to give a brief mission presentation. She's going to be helping out at the Gospel Fest in Alaska. And also, we will be recognizing our high school and college graduates. So if you just graduated from college, and I think I know who the high school grads are, but if you finished college, let us know so we can celebrate with you Sunday, June 1st. We have any other announcements to highlight? Yes, yeah, Sherry. Okay, today's the last day of Sunday school. There's a carnival in the basement afterwards, and it's $2 cover charge. You get into it, and you'll be able to have a good time playing the games. And are there prizes, too? Cakewalk, everybody gets a treat bag at the end. Everyone gets a treat bag at the end. That's worth the price of admission right there, not to mention what you might win. So join us after Sunday school this morning. Okay, yes, Steve. Hey, Dale and Judy Hernke, 45th wedding anniversary. Awesome. Yes, Kim. Okay, you need the third, fourth, and fifth graders to come to class for five minutes before you go downstairs today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Maria. Okay, appreciate all hands on deck for Vacation Bible School. Please sign the, the, the sheet in the narthex saying you'll be able to help out, even if it's for one day out of the five or two days out of the five. It would be most welcome and appreciated. Yes, Becky. Mm -hmm. okay, Spencer Thiel celebrated his birthday on Friday. Hey, Spencer. Happy birthday. And this concludes our morning announcements. Let us pray. And Father, we thank you for your grace and your goodness, and we dedicate this time of worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and reflect back. Number 351, since Jesus came into my heart. Number 351, let's sing to the Lord.
good singing. We'll remain standing for the reciting of the Apostles' Creed, found in the back of the songbook on the right side, and also on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We have a special music presentation from the Potter's Clay.
Thank you very much. The kids can come up for the children's sermon. sometimes get thirsty and you need a drink. Okay, very good. Now, when you're thirsty, you go and, and you get some juice. And wh what do you pour the juice in before you drink it? Yeah. Okay, you pour it in a cup. Very good. Now, if you pour it in a styrofoam cup, that's good because then you don't have to do dishes, right? But what do you have to check to make sure before you pour something in a styrofoam cup? Yeah. Make sure it's not broken in it, be, be broken because if it's got a hole in it, what's going to happen to the juice? It's going to spill out all over the place. We won't try to replicate that here today because it'll take a hard time to clean it. But, and, and also, it's the same thing, Jesus says it's the same thing with um, his teaching. We need to make sure that we take his teaching into our life and that we don't have a hole where it all runs out and we forget about it. We need to make sure that we remember that he loves us, that we remember that we can talk to him anytime we want, and that he is always with us. We can't let that leak out. We need to let that, we need to keep that. Let us pray. God, I thank you that you do love us, and I pray that that's something that we'll be able to hold in our hearts forever and ever, that you have died for our sins and rose again, and you're with us always, even to the end of the age. In your name we pray, amen. Our Bible reading comes from Luke chapter 5. Next week we start a new series called How Do I Know That? And each week we'll talk about how we know certain truths about God and Jesus in the Bible. But this week we're finishing the fifth chapter of Luke and picking up the action in verse 33. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new won't match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says, the old is better. This is the word of the Lord, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of Scripture. And Father, we thank you for the Bible. And I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might be faithful to Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Charles Kettering says, People are very open-minded about new things, as long as they're exactly like the old things. <laughs> Sometimes we're leery of change. We're afraid to find out we might be doing something wrong. Or we're afraid to find out that something we've been doing all this time doesn't work so well anymore. And we have to go back to the drawing board. That's where the Pharisees were with Jesus. They were finding out that their ways of doing things were outdated, outmoded, and even outlandish. And they were getting defensive about it and angry. Who does this Jesus person think he is telling us that our ways are outdated. How should we react when Jesus asks us to be more flexible? How can we hold on to the tried and true teachings of the faith while also being open to vibrant and new ways of expressing the faith? That's what we're going to find out today. We're in Luke 5. In verses 28 to 32, Jesus gets criticized for eating at the ta same table with sinners 
beginning in verse 33, he gets criticized for eating, period. It's like he can't get a break with these guys. Every time he does something, they're ready to nitpick. And the Pharisees say, how is it that we fast and the disciples of John the Baptist fast, but yours go on eating? Fasting, as you know, is going without food or drink for a limited period of time so you can seek the presence of God. It's your way of saying, God, I want to, my desire and hunger for you is greater than the hunger I have for the food I eat each day. And I mean business. I want to make contact with you. And it's not a bad approach. Luke 18, verse 11 says the Pharisees fast twice a week. And you have stories like Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel fasts and prays to God and makes contact with him. But Jesus is saying that's not going to fit this situation. They don't have to fast to make contact with me because they have contact with me. I'm right here standing next to them. It's, why should they say, oh God, I'm not going to eat bread or bagels or fish until I've made contact with you, until you've shown up, when the Lord has already showed up? That would be bizarre. Can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is still with them? Why do that? Now, rules, rituals, and regulations are important. I'm not making fun of them. We need them. I thank God for them. We say the Lord's Prayer every week. I thank God for that centering prayer. But at the same time, we've got to be flexible. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And when we're gathered in the name of Jesus Christ to celebrate what he's been doing in our lives all week long, it's okay to say amen. It's okay to say praise the Lord. And it's okay to head over to mom's place after the service and eat from the buffet. Amen? I remember years ago, I used to date somebody who didn't believe in going out to eat on Sunday, presumably because it's the Lord's Day and you're making somebody else work when they could have been in church with you that morning. And I'm not a type A alpha male, so I towed the line while we dated. But as soon as we broke up, the very next week, I celebrated the goodness of God by going to Ponderosa! Woohoo! <laughs> I ate the chicken wings! Thank God for chicken wings. And Jesus is saying, this is not a time for fasting, it's a time for feasting. It's a celebration because God is here. Lives are being changed. People are getting saved. Proverbs 15, 15 says, All the days of the oppressed are wretched, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Now, I'm not denying that there are times of seriousness and sadness in life. When someone you love passes away, you're not going to feel like jumping up and down and praising God like a Pentecostal on Dancing with the Stars. I understand that. And there are, Jesus even says, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And in that day, they will fast. When Jesus dies on the cross for our sins, the disciples aren't going to understand that they're going to be in mourning and in gloom and not eating for those three days. And even today, we have serious moments in life, like the Lenten season, right? Where we fast and we focus on our faith. Or the 30-hour famine, where we call upon God to help the starving children of the world. But generally speaking, the Christian life is a joyful life because we have the heavenly bridegroom with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And next, Jesus tells a couple of parables to explain how his dynamic teaching is just not compatible with the legalistic approach of the Pharisees. First, he says, no one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. Let's say your daughter has a hole in her old jeans by the kneecap. She goes out and buys a new pair from Cole. She comes back home and says, Guess what, Mom? I just bought a new pair of jeans. I'm going to rip a hole out of the new pair and put it on my old pair. Isn't that a good idea? <laughs> you know, you're going to say, We're going to take you to see Dr. Phil. <laughs> because that is just crazy. That is bonkers. Who in their right mind would cut a piece out of a new garment and put it on an old one? You'd be ruining the new garment. But you know what? 
We do stuff like that all the time. We go to church, we say the Lord's Prayer, we try to patch a little bit of Christianity on top of the holes in our old life, and we say, hey, I'm good to go. I got the Jesus patch on me. I can do whatever I want for the rest of the week. I can talk back to my parents. I can run mom's cell phone bill through the roof. I can make my room a mess and not listen to them when they tell me to clean it. I can get blitzed on Friday and Saturday and come to church, ask for forgiveness, and it's all good. And it's all good because I got the patch. I'm all patched up. And Jesus is saying, I didn't come here to do that. I'm not here to put a patch of approval on the Pharisee way of life or your old way of life. I'm here to give you a new one. A life of worship and reflection on the word of God. A life where we take up our crosses and follow him. A life of service to others other than just ourselves. How do I know that? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Jesus says, if you tear a patch from the new garment and you try putting it on the old garment, it's not going to fit. The, the, the two are not compatible. I'm not here to renovate. I'm here to, to make something completely new. And yet, in old days, people tried to patch the Jesus way of doing things with Judaism. And fortunately, Peter and Paul and the apostles wouldn't let that happen. In Acts chapter 15, verse 1, some people were saying it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. Unless you are circumcised, unless you follow the entire law of Moses, you can't be saved. And Peter stands up in Acts 15, verse 11, and says, No, we believe that it is by the grace of the Lord Jesus that we are saved. And Paul says the same thing in Romans 3.28. He says, we maintain that a man is justified by faith and not by observing the works of the law. You can't patch the teachings of Jesus on top of old, ritual, rigid, regimented ways of doing things. It's not going to happen. And then Jesus gives a second parable. The first one was about patches. The second one was about wineskins. He says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. Goat skins were used to hold fresh wine. And as the grape juice fermented inside the wineskin, the wine would expand and the new wineskin would stretch and become rigid. There wasn't room for any more expansion. So if you tried to pour fresh new wine into an already expanded wineskin, you would end up popping the stitches and then it would explode all over the place. And everybody knew this. They are probably laughing under their breath while Jesus was trying to explain it to the Pharisees like they were six-year-olds because they didn't get it. No one in their right mind would try putting fresh wine in a worn-out wineskin. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to pour the new wine of my teaching into the old wine skin of Pharisaic Judaism. It needs to be poured into people and in churches and in ministries who are flexible and open to the new things God wants to do in their lives. I just heard about the new book by Mariano Rivera. He is the relief pitcher for the New York Yankees. He's on his way to the Hall of Fame. The guy is awesome. And the book is appropriately titled, The Closer. And in the book, he talks a lot about his personal faith in Christ. He says, when I was a teenager, I thought the most important thing in life was partying. I wasted a lot of time pursuing a lot of meaningless, empty activities that left me feeling unfulfilled on the inside. But during my fourth year of pitching in the minor leagues, I faced some personal trials that forced me to take a good hard look at the way I was living. And I realized that I was trying to look like Jesus on, the, on Sunday and not live like Jesus during the week. I realized if I ever hoped to reach my goals, I had to turn to Jesus for help and stop being a hypocrite. So I asked Jesus to forgive my sins and invited him to take charge of my life. Now I still like to enjoy myself. 
that's okay. But now I'm able to keep everything in perspective because I know that following Christ is the most important thing in my life. If you're caught up in a lifestyle that leaves you feeling empty on the inside, I encourage you to seek out a new life in Christ. Mariano gave up the old wine of sin for the new wine of abundant life in Jesus. You can have it too. All you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and rising again. I want the new wine. I want the abundant life that only you can give. I want to be a fresh, new, flexible wineskin that is able to receive all the blessings you have for my life and not just a couple that I hold on to tenaciously, like a squirrel holding on to a couple of acorns. I don't want to be that way. I want to be open. The sad thing is that some folks prefer the old wine of sin over the new wine of Jesus. Listen to the sad commentary Jesus makes about the Jewish leaders in verse 39. No one after drinking the old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. The Pharisees were saying, if it is new, it can't be true. The old is better. Every time Jesus said something new or did something new, you can almost hear the sounds of popping and snapping and exploding wineskins all around them because they just couldn't handle it. Remember Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men? You can't handle the truth! Jesus very well could have said that to these Pharisees because that was their reaction. Now this attitude of not being able to handle the truth is nothing new. Unfortunately, we have a long history of it going back years. Not that long ago, the idea of sending missionaries to other countries was a radical idea. Nobody would ever think of doing it. But William Carey stood up at a religious annual meeting and he said, you know, I just read in the Bible that Matthew 28, 18 says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If Jesus told us to go to the nations, then why aren't we going to the nations? And if we're not going to the nations, why aren't we at least encouraging others to go to the nations? And an older minister said, sit down, young man. If God wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your help or my help. Now that guy was a Christian, but he was drinking too much old wine. And sometimes as believers, we do that as well. We get so addicted to the old stuff, we're not ready to receive all the new things that God has. Now one of the things I love about our church is that, at least as long as I've been here, we've always been open to the new things that God wants to do in us. The reason why we have an awesome Gospel Fest ministry in the month of August is because we were open to fresh and new, vibrant expressions of God in our lives. And the reason why we just had two powerful offerings of Financial Peace University is because our church is still open to vibrant and new expressions of learning and getting close to God. And the reason why we're strongly considering purchasing property connected to our church parking lot is because we're open to what God wants to do in the life of the church in the future. It's an awesome way to be, to be a flexible new wineskin. But the Pharisees don't exist anymore in part because they weren't open to the new things God wanted them to do. In Luke chapter 6, when Jesus and his disciples were eating grain on the Sabbath, the Pharisees rebuked them for it. And in Luke 6, verses 6 through 11, when Jesus healed a man who had been hurting for a long time, instead of praising God that the man had been healed, they thought of ways to assassinate the one who did the healing. Their old wineskins couldn't handle the new work of God. If you want to be a new wineskin that is always open and flexible to the things that he wants to do in your life, you have to do two things. Number one, make a list of the things that are tried and true that you're not going to budge on. I have five things on my list. Number one, my relationship with Jesus. I won't budge on that. I'm not going to do anything that's going to deliberately mess up my relationship with the Lord. 
Uh, let me revise that. I'm going to try not to do anything to mess up my relationship with the Lord. I, I mean, we're human, right? We mess up. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15 says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. That the implication in there is that once in a while, you know, it's, it's not your best. Or once in a while, your attempt at doing your best isn't enough. We all fall short. B, my marriage is something I won't budge on. I'd rather have five flaming arrows shot straight into my heart than do something that's going to hurt Jeannie or wreck my marriage and embarrass Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. I'm not, I hold my marriage sacred. I'm not budging on that. And number three, the Bible is the word of God. From Genesis 1-1 to the maps at the back of the Bible, I believe that every word of God is true and he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. I'm not budging on that. I'm standing on the word of God until I'm with the Lord. And even then I'm going to stand on it. And four, the Apostles' Creed and the Peace Church Statement of Faith. I personally believe that these are accurate summaries of Christian teaching. And I'm going to stand true on them and not budge. And E, love one another. Jesus says in John 13, 34, I give you a new command, love each other as I have loved you. If Jesus said it, I believe it, that settles it, I'm going to love one another. Now the second thing you need to do is to make a th list of things that you are willing to budge on. A list where you're willing to be flexible on. And I only got two words on that list, and it's not because I'm not flexible. The two words are everything else. <laughs> everything that's not on the first list, I'm going to be flexible with on the other list. For example, if the church ever allowed younger students who believed in Jesus to take communion, I might be against that. I'm going to let my voice be heard. But if the church voted to change the policy, I could accept it without popping a stitch in my wineskin because it falls under the everything else category. Or if in the future we wanted to start a Spanish-speaking worship service once a month on Saturday night, someone might say, oh, we should never do that. We've never done that before. We shouldn't cater to them in their language. They need to learn our language. They need to learn English. But if people had a heart for the ministry and wanted to do it, I could accept that without popping a stitch in my wineskin because it falls under the everything else category. I think that's what we have to do in order to, main, to remain flexible and open to the new wine of the gospel that Jesus wants to pour into the ministries of Peace Church. And that's my prayer, is that we'll hold on to the tried and the true on list number one, while being open to what Jesus wants to write down on list number two. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. Father, we thank you for the scriptures. Help us not become, help us to hold on to the tried and the true. We're told in Titus 2.1, that we have to teach what's in accord with sound doctrine. We're not going to get away from that. But help us to be open to new ways of expressing the sound doctrine. Help us not to become so rigid that we explode like the Pharisees. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll remain seated and sing our song of commitment. Savior like a shepherd lead us, verse 1. And verse 4, right? Savior like a shepherd be this.
have any special prayer requests? Lynn. Need to pray for college students taking exams this week. Also, Lynn Stecker's dad having its hip surgery on June 2nd. Let us pray. God, we love you so much. We thank you for the, for the teachings of Jesus. Help us to be part of new wineskins. Help us to be the wineskins that receive the, the potent, powerful new teaching that you have for us in your word and so that we can apply it to our lives. Lord, also we want to pray for the people you put upon our hearts. We pray for Joanna Strzeski for continued healing in her life. We pray for college students. This is a very busy time. They're they're getting ready to graduate. Some of them had final exams yet this week. I pray, God, that you would give them strength and determination to focus. And I pray, Lord, that as they sip their coffee and as they go over their notes, that you'd help them to retain the materials that, that need to become implemented and intertwined in their thoughts so they can do well on the exam. We pray, Lord, also for Lynn Stecker's dad, Richard Brantmeyer, who's going to be having hip surgery June 2nd. We pray for a safe, successful surgical procedure. Pray for him to experience the grace and salvation of Jesus in his life. We, we pray, Lord, for all the unspoken requests around the parish and in a crowd this size, they're out there. And We pray, God, you would be close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And Father, also, we want to pray for our leaders that you would give them wisdom to make wise choices. We pray for our troops, keep them safe both here and around the world. Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.